Um, first of all, I'm a bit nervous here because there has been two great scientists and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor. Actually, 20 years ago I did my PhD studies but I never finished them because I met this French philosopher and um, he asked about my dissertation and then I gave my short pitch about my dissertation and then he looked at me and then he said, Eric, for 3,000 years great minds have tried to solve that issue. What makes you think that you will do it? So I gave up and I <laughs> went to industry anyway. So I will talk about the network society if I can switch page. There we go. Because as the introduction indicated, I really truly believe that we are on the brink of a new societal order and it's based on information and communication technology diffusing out in all aspects of life, diffusing out in all aspects of society. And also with the technological development we can connect and network more and more things. And 50 years, I'm not advertising my birthday because it's pretty close though, but uh, things happen that really changes society and usually it happens once or twice every century and it's the process of a technological innovation becomes what we call a general purpose technology and of course the steam engine uh, the automotive became general purpose technologies and now information and communication technology has moved from being quite specific with communication solutions, computing solutions, and now, as I said, diffusing out in all aspects of life. And that changes societal order. That changes what we produce, how we produce it, where we produce it. It changes regulations and it changes life. And I will show you one picture from my home. Um, showing how ordinary life can change thanks to general purpose technology. Um, uh, this is every Saturday in my home. I have a son that really loves football. Uh, and now, thanks to technology, he can watch four games at the same time. And of course, that gives me a headache because I'm used to watching one game. But he, 16 years old, he wants to watch four games. So he watches one on his phone, one on the laptop, one on the iPad and one on the um, big screen. And then he subscribes because it's 15 seconds delay and he subscribes to an SMS alert which tells him which game they score. And then he switches over to the big screen again. Um, <clears throat> and it, Actually it's quite horrible. Uh, and, and you can think about, okay, consumer behavior is changing thanks to technology. We are really changing as individuals. But what I think is really interesting is this is transformative to the media industry. Because five years ago, this was not possible. But now it's possible. And now traditional media companies need to relate to this new technology. So they have to bet their economics on that this will work, that the subscribers or the consumers will like it. They need to think about, will this cannibalize my traditional revenues? And also, how much will this cost me as a media company, as a broadcaster or a satellite um, operator? So technology changes consumer behavior and consumer behavior changes industry dynamics and market dynamics. And of course, suddenly it becomes totally disruptive because suddenly uh, earlier suppliers to broadcasters like HBO or people that make TV series, they think, why should I sell my content to an aggregator? I can go directly to the consumer. And then the whole industry dynamic starts to evolve and really become uh, quite messy. Uh, Marshall McLuhan in 1968 said, we become what we behold. First we shape the tools and then the tools shape us. And I think that is happening now. 
This is one example. Another example is that I could ask you a question. What is the first thing you touch in the morning? And please, I don't want to know, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's just a rhetoric question. Uh, no, but uh, usually it's the mobile phone because you turn off the alarm clock. And then people actually start to surf while lying in bed. 38% of smartphone users surf before they go out of bed. And then you can see they checking emails, Facebook, etc., etc. And then you can see that they are using the smartphone not for communication in the traditional sense, voice, SMS. They are using it for updating profiles, checking emails, internet usage, quite evenly distributed during nights. Then, of course, um, 32% are using it eating din dinner, uh, which I can f feel is quite depressing, but still they are doing it. And then people go to bed and then they start to surf. 50% are doing it. And I think the smartphone is just six years old. And suddenly, when getting a new device with new capabilities, we start to change behavior in a dramatic sense. And this is transformative for my industry because we didn't foresee this. Uh, because now we have to change business models. We need to change and relate to this new reality. Um, what I feel really confident and positive about is that now young people like you in the audience is starting to use this technology for a good sake. And you become a transformative force in the society. This is Irina. She lives in Moscow. And she has this site called Lisa Alert. She has built a community of volunteers finding missing kids in Moscow. And she's using all these technologies to organize help actions and find missing kids in Moscow. And actually, she's more effective in finding missing kids in Moscow than the Moscow police. And of course, that's disruptive for the Moscow police, but still, I think people are doing things that is really good, not for commercial reasons. They are doing it because they can. And that becomes an even stronger force in the future. Um, other ones that are using technology in a different way than we foresaw is John Deere, the world's largest manufacturer of tractors. Boring product. But still, he's not making tractors any, go any longer. He's making sophisticated mobile information factories because he's using all these technologies to get more output from farming. He wants to have better quality. And he sees the power of computer networking and digitalization. So he's transforming the farming industry to become something else than it was earlier. And of course, when a farmer starts to using this technology, packing it, the output with information, it changes the logistics and it changes the factories that takes care of, in this case, cotton, because he's using RFID tags, he's using sensors to measure quality and quantity, etc. Now logistics needs to take care of that information and relate to that. The, the factory needs to also relate to that, and then suddenly you see change in the industrial systems. I said innovation is changing also, and I think this is also interesting. I had really problems with the saying that no one is smarter than everyone. It took me a long time before I accepted that. But now we see Kraft, we see Procter & Gamble, large companies opening up for col collaboration. We see Collaboration Kitchen where actually problems that Kraft has and they cannot solve. They are posting it on the home page and asking for help. So suddenly we can reach the global brain thanks to digitalization, thanks to broadband, and that we as a globe is getting more and more connected. And this changes organizations. It opens up. They become more transparent, and they need to relate to the global forces. 
The problem we have as a society is that information technology is growing exponentially, but our intuition about the future is not exponential, it's linear. And I will show you some examples about how linear thinking has actually changed uh, markets. Because my message today is that we need to have a new mindset. Because now, thanks to mobile technology, information technology, networking, we have empowered individuals that can reach information, reach knowledge, and share it with everyone thanks to technology. We see how businesses are extending their presence in the value chain, like, just like John Deere's tractors. And also we have this enabling technology. So we need to have a new mindset. We need to ask ourselves, what is my business ID? What kind of role do I want to play now and in the future? Uh, this is photography market in 1995. And of course, Kodak was really successful making films, and they defined their business as making films for photographers. And then digitalization and networking came, and we can see how profit totally changed, and now role film retail is more or less gone, because Kodak and the other companies define their business as making film, and new players like the memory manufacturers, digital camera retail, totally new categories came out. And without this development, YouTube would never exist, Flickr would never exist. And now we as individuals are taking more and more photographs than ever. But for companies that didn't understand this, development, the result was quite bad because they were out of business. So we need to rethink our business all the time. We need to rethink what can I do with technology and how can I make this place a better place? Because what's happening now is that we see a total transformation of the world. We see how entertainment first was transformed by digitalization and networking. We saw how the distribution revolution came out, destroying the traditional music industry, but also started new companies like Amazon, and also starting to get governments thinking about e-government strategies, but now, in the 2010s, we see, as I see it, total digital transformation of all aspects of life. We have the mobile revolution, we see how social media is affecting not only newspapers, but all companies that they need to relate to it and have a discussion with the market. We see the power of the cloud and in the example of Lease Alert, the power of the crowd. We see now downstream and upstream innovation and how people can organize without having an organization because they know how to utilize ICT and engage the global network. And this is only the beginning because now we see the emergence of Internet of Things where anything that can benefit from a network connection will have one. Changing business processes, giving totally new opportunities to do things differently. Uh, <clears throat> so, we are entering what I call the network society where all activities in society, in some way or another, will use broadband, digitalization, networking to deliver new types of services, to make more efficiencies, and to create totally new solutions. And of course, with that mindset, a new mindset, we can actually, for the first time in history, address the global challenges in a new way. We can think about how can I utilize this digital infrastructure to actually take out poverty, to change the way we consume and produce water, how can I increase the output from farming, how can I address the environmental challenges. 
because I think now we have the chance to do it. Because the only th constant now is change. Change will never be as slow as it is today. But what we need to remember is that change gives opportunities. And I think there we have a responsibility. Of course, we can be defensive, we can try to, to not develop it, but I think we need to see the opportunities today. Because now we have an enormous amount of opportunities to actually change the world to a better place. And I ask myself this. Uh, you can see we have the same hairdresser. Um, it, it's my son. And I really ask myself, what kind of world will I give to my son? He's 16 years old. What and how will it, the world look like when he grows, uh, when he gets old? Will there be a dramatic climate change? Will the sea level rise with seven meters? Will we have terrorism, war? Will we have poor people starving? Or will we take the small steps and the small initiatives to actually change the world? And I don't say that ICT is the solution, but ICT can be the solution of actually changing the world. Because what we see now is that innovation is not only for big companies. Anyone can innovate, thanks to ICT. We see how we can be productive because thanks to the network, we can organize capabilities in a new way. We can change the business model. It's not about having lots of capital. We can really make a difference. We see how we can create stuff in totally new ways, engaging the global network. And we have, for the first time also, a reach to what I call a global knowledge. And then we need to think about how should we distribute the resources? How will we distribute value in the future? And how will work look like? And what kind of world do we want to give to our young kids that will grow up in this landscape of opportunity at the same time, it's quite scary because we have really some global challenges to take care of. And I think what is extremely important for governments, enterprises, and we as individuals is to have a vision. A vision about the future. And then you need to remember a vision is not just a picture of what could be. It's an appeal to our best selves, meaning that we can really address some of the global, regional, regional and local challenges. And also, it's a call to become something more as individuals, as countries, and as a world. Thank you very much for listening.